What's up guys and welcome to One Take. Tonight we're talking about Westworld Season 3, Episode 2, The Winter Line. I'm Gil, I'm here with my brother slash tech guy, Alun. Yo. And before we jump into it, just a warning, this video is going to be full of spoilers for Westworld through Season 3, Episode 2, but that doesn't include spoilers for any future episodes, and that includes the next time on previews. I don't watch those previews. I haven't even watched any of the previews for Season 3 as a whole, so there won't be any spoilers from those trailers. And also, before we jump into the recap, just a quick reminder to subscribe if you're enjoying these videos so you get notified the next time we go live and you can be part of the conversation. So jumping into episode two of season three, I'll say overall I enjoyed this episode, but probably enjoyed it a little bit less than episode one. And that's less a knock against this episode and more, I think they just set the bar pretty high with the first episode. I love the new world that was introduced in episode one, the world outside the park. It's an awesome looking world. It's an interesting world. I liked Bernard on the run, again, outside the park. And I love Aaron Paul's character, Cal. So I missed all of those elements in this episode. And there were a few other nitpicks that we'll get into as we jump into the plot. Alon, any other overall thoughts on the episode before we jump into the details of it? I definitely agree with everything you said. I missed being taken away from that that world we were introduced to in episode one, all the cool buildings and technology. Right. Uh, I wanted to see the next part of Aaron Paul's story. Yep, Cal. Yeah, yeah Cal. Um, but overall, I liked this episode much better than how uh, all the two. episodes in season two. Yeah. So I, I feel good. Agreed. Well, let's jump in. Let's talk about Maeve and her story, and then we'll jump over to Bernard and Stubbs a great buddy cop drama, I think, that's uh, <laughs> forming there. So Maeve is back in War World, the World War II world. She runs into Hector, who she recognizes from the old park. He talks about escaping, and so she thinks that he remembers what's going on. He, too, wants to escape from this fake world, which Maeve has escaped from multiple times. But we quickly find out that Hector... When he talks about escaping, he means that within the context of the World War II storyline they're a part of. He doesn't remember that he is a sentient being. He doesn't remember that he's a host. Hector gets killed, and immediately afterwards, Maeve kills herself. One thing we said about episode one is that in general, I think they've done a great job of making the hosts, more characters that we can sympathize with. I think they attempted to do that in season two. May have worked for some people, but for me, it was impossible to get past Dolores and Maeve at times coming off as sociopathic murderers. <laughs> <laughs> and here, I truly felt bad for Maeve. She essentially sees Hector, somebody who gained sentience and then lost it, it felt like she was seeing a friend of hers get lobotomized. He completely lost his personality. So when she went to kill herself, even though I know it's not truly ending her life, I felt bad for her and I felt bad for her to have to see her friend that way. She killed herself so she could wake up back behind the scenes of the park. And when she's there, she sees that Felix doesn't recognize her. Sylvester doesn't recognize her. And then she bumps into Lee who we thought died in season two. And he reveals that he survived. The reason that he planted her into War World is because War World is located near the Forge. Maeve can get to the Forge, place herself in the Valley Beyond. That's sort of heaven for the hosts that was revealed last season. And she can be with her daughter again. Now, this episode caught me off guard in a couple of ways. Right here, I started to roll my eyes and say, we're really doing this plot again? Maeve trying to get with her daughter. Maeve trying to escape from a fake world. And I started to immediately turn on the show and say, you know, you gave me so much goodwill in episode one just to lose it again. And the show said, don't worry. None of this is real. She's in a simulation. And I said, okay, I'm back on board. And I thought they did a great job with the Lee character because I was surprised to see he was still alive. And I did notice something was a little off about him. 
But it wasn't so off that I thought, oh, he's definitely fake. Felix and Sylvester, they seemed not to remember her. But in my mind, it might have just been them trying to keep things on the down low. You and I kept rolling our eyes saying, why the hell would Felix go <laughs> back to work after all this? And it all seemed a little bit off, but not so off that they gave it up that this is a simulation. Mm -hmm. So I thought they thread that needle really well. And then when it hits her, the world starts to go crazy and she realizes she's in a simulation. Again, we get a great emotional moment of Lee realizing he's not a real person. He's a copy of the real Lee who did actually die. Couple of emotional beats there that I loved. One, when he realizes it and he starts to stutter, I am Lee, 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 Lee. you know, <laughs> that was great. And when she says the real Lee died a good man, again, doing a great job of making me actually care about the hosts this season. I would say every character, I care way more mm -hmm. about this season than I did last season. Now, I will say again, the show almost lost me because I said, okay, Maeve is in a simulation. Here is the new mystery box for season three. What is this simulation all about? Who's creating this simulation? But then again, all of that is revealed in this episode. So they're giving us the mystery box, but it's little mystery boxes. <laughs> Hand it to you and they open it up later in the episode. So how does Maeve escape the simulation though? And this is where we might get to some of our nitpicks this episode. She essentially realizes that this is an imperfect simulation. I think what triggers that for her is the idea that Lee is a replica. She realizes that this world is a replica. It's a poor replica. It doesn't work that well. So if she can overwhelm the system, she can essentially crash it. How does she learn this? Her first test of overwhelming the system is a couple of texts show up and she asks them what is the square root of negative one. They start to get into this whole circular reference thing and crash. I think, Alon, this was the first time in the episode I really saw you start to roll <laughs> your eyes. So what was it about this that, that kind of yeah. bothered you? It was, just, it was pretty lame, in my opinion. I, I just can't imagine their programmers so smart they can build this simulation, but they don't account for these potential circular logic situations that can just overwhelm the whole system. I just think it's a little crazy and uh, you're probably going to get to this part soon, but when uh, Maeve tries to overload the system a second time by confusing all the hosts, by giving them all that le letters, the, the letter. um, secret notes or yeah, whatever. I, I I thought that these programmers were able to code AI smart enough that they can adapt to new situations and, right. and know how they should be interacting with each other based on new events. Right. In principle, I'm not opposed to the idea that you have thrown together a simulation as a mini prison for Maeve. And Maeve is this super advanced AI. And I can even buy that AIs have become so advanced and developed. There are these complicated algorithms that a human being even the person who programmed the AI probably couldn't look at it and understand everything that's mm -hmm. in the code there. So they might not entirely know what they're dealing with. So it's a little bit dangerous to take a shoddy simulation, stick an advanced AI in there. She reasonably could hack the system from within. I buy that, but I just found the execution of it to be a little bit hokey. The whole square root of negative one confusing the two texts I felt like I was watching a scene out of Rick and Morty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was really the problem for me, uh, especially considering we find out that Serac is the one behind the simulation. He's the one who runs Rehobo Rehoboam, such a hard name to pronounce. <laughs> I'm going to call it Reho for short. He runs this database that predicts the path of all of humanity. So they should have a pretty good understanding <laughs> of human behavior. Yeah. So those two texts, when they get asked, what's the square root of negative one? Instead of crashing the system, they should say, who the hell cares? I don't have time for this. Yeah. So move on. Yeah. It should notice that circular logic is about to occur and say something like that to just Even Excel. It. If I put in circular logic in Excel, it warns me. It says, <laughs> by the way, we've detect detected some circular logic. You might want to check that out. It doesn't just crash the system. Yeah. You know, I actually, I love the idea that Maeve is so smart that she's able to deduce that she's in a simulation. But I think that the way she hacked the system 
I think it could, they could have done something a little better. What I what I think could have been cool is if she started making all the hosts act weird like she did, but because of that, someone on the outside notices something weird is happening, so then they investigate, then they take her out to do some testing, and then maybe right, she escapes. Right. So I, I think we both agree, in principle, it's not a bad idea what they did here. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't want them to draw this out. I was psyched that she got out of the simulation in this episode. Mm-hmm. So they had to do it quickly. I think trying to rush through this plot is maybe a little bit of why it felt somewhat silly to us. Right. But anyway, she is able to overwhelm the system and use the glitching system to hack into the broader system. And she can actually see images from the real world. She sees security footage of the lab where she's being kept. She spots herself, the little pearl that contains her consciousness, and then hacks into one of the real world robots and we get a pretty cool scene where that robot smashes open the glass, <laughs> a bunch of liquid pours out. Visually, the show is firing on all cylinders this season, I'll say. I think it I think it generally has always done really well visually, even when the show suffered in some other ways. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she grabs her pearl as this real world robot, and we get an awesome visual of that robot fighting its way out, running. And then again, I felt bad for the robot when it gets <laughs> overwhelmed, it starts getting shot, and then drops that pearl yeah but i also felt bad for those guards that the robot caused to die right (laughs) so there were some deaths in this scene i will (laughs) say it didn't seem like she was necessarily going out of her way Mm -hmm. to kill people and to be fair these were people that were firing at her so again they're doing a good job of not making me hate the main characters of this show Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just the visual of that robot clenching one fist and running and trying to find its way out I thought was a probably my favorite moment in Maeve's storyline mm-hmm. in this episode. So, like I said, the curtain is peeled back. The little mystery box is opened. We find out this simulation is being run by Serac. That is the person that Dolores is looking for. The person whose name she just learned at the end of episode one. He is an important person at Insight. He is the one who runs the Riho database The one that Dolores' boyfriend, Liam, admitted that he does not run. And he's the man Dolores is looking for. So we learn a little bit about Serac and his system. He explains that this database, it doesn't just predict the future, but it essentially charts the right path for humanity. It ensures that we all go to a good future. And it's been doing a good job of it until now. There was some new threat. They thought it was Maeve. This morning, they learned that they were wrong. They figured out that the threat is Dolores. So why did they capture Maeve? Serac wants Maeve to go and kill Dolores. Dolores doesn't like that. She goes to kill Serac. He freezes her and essentially says, maybe the next time we talk, I can convince you, I can persuade you that our interests are aligned. Now, How is he going to do that? The only thing I could think of is she will not be convinced in a sympathetic way to care about humanity. I don't think that's going to happen. He has to appeal to her in some purely selfish way. So maybe he's going to try and paint a picture to her. Or he doesn't doesn't even have to paint the picture. The Riho database, Riho Boehm, I'm going to try and pronounce it can probably show Dolores, hey, or can probably show Maeve, hey, if Dolores is successful, this is what the world is going to look like. It's not a world you're going to want to live in. And maybe that's how he will persuade Maeve to stop Dolores. And I think from Serac's perspective, that's really enough. If Maeve can stop Dolores, I don't think Maeve is a threat. She doesn't seem to have She doesn't like humanity, but she doesn't seem to have a desire to destroy humanity. I think as long as he can give her what she wants, and that might be another way he's going to influence her. Hey, I can get you back to your daughter. I can get you into the valley beyond. Or better yet, I can pluck your daughter's consciousness out, stick her in a body. You can have her in the real world. I think there's a lot he can offer her here, and I think that's how he's going to convince her to fight Dolores. But Who knows how easy that's going to be. Anyway, any other thoughts on the Maeve, Serac storyline before we move on to Bernard and Stubbs? 
No, you covered it. Let's get to, uh, I love Stubbs' uh, character in this season. Yeah, I knew you would. And before <laughs> we go to Bernard and Stubbs, just another quick reminder, if you're enjoying this live stream, if you're enjoying this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon so you get notified the next time we go live. And you can be a part of the conversation. You can contribute your theories. You can tell me I'm getting something wrong. We can get into a little bit of an argument. It'll be fun. <laughs> Join the live stream next time. Anyway, let's jump over to Bernard and Stubbs. So this is another instance where the episode almost lost me. I love being outside the park. At the end of episode one, when Bernard said he's going back to Westworld, I thought, really? Get out of the park. I'm so happy to be outside the park. And I actually thought this whole season was going to be his adventure getting back to Westworld, but boom, he's in Westworld. The first time we see him this episode, he's right there. And once he's in Westworld, again, I'm sitting there saying, damn, I don't want to be back in the park. And then the episode gives me something I wasn't expecting. We see Stubbs, and he apparently tried to kill himself but failed, <laughs> which is kind of funny when you think about it. This robot should have perfect aim. Somehow he missed, but now he's sitting there. He's been stuck in place for probably three or so months. I think it's been about 100 days since they escaped the park, and he's just all messed up. He's cursing at Bernard. It was kind of sad but kind of funny to see too. Also, the fact that his character, why did he try to kill himself? It's because he was given very specific instructions. Protect Bernard, buy him some time, help him get out of the park, which he did, so time to retire. It reminded me a lot of the IG-11 unit in episode one of The Mandalorian, <laughs> where it kept trying to self-destruct, and The Mandalorian had to keep stopping it. It was hilarious there, and it was maybe even funnier here, just because of how serious the tone of this show is. And then to have the Stubbs character keep trying to retire himself, <laughs> one of my favorite aspects of this episode. So right away, disappointed to be back in the park. That lasts about 40 seconds. We see Stubbs and I say, all right, I'm back on board. I love the Bernard and Stubbs team up. So following their story, we learn why Bernard came back to Westworld. Episode one, I think we all figured the reason he went back He's looking for some sort of a weapon to stop Dolores. What is that weapon? We find out it's Maeve. Now, it is kind of funny to me. I don't know why everyone thinks Maeve is the best way to stop Dolores. Bernard wants her to stop Dolores. Ciroc wants her to stop Dolores. I have a feeling there's more. To, it's not just the fact that she's a killer robot. I'm sure you could build a new right. killer robot. There was a lab full of them this episode. <laughs> So I'm interested to learn a little bit more about, I could see Bernard, you know, for him, it's a known entity. He knows Maeve, so that's just a natural place to go. I'm really interested to figure out why Ciroc thinks she's this sort of secret weapon. So we learn why Bernard came back to the park. We also hear his speculation on why Dolores brought him back from season two it felt like Dolores, it was almost a Batman Joker thing. We need each other, Bernard. <laughs> From Bernard's perspective, he thinks Dolores brought him back because she may be afraid she's going to go too far. So he's there to be the kind of check and balance to her. It'd be, I, I'm interested to see that explored further because it's just hard for me to wrap my head around that. Dolores, cold, calculating, I want to destroy humanity. Why would she put a roadblock for herself Curious to see if we're going to explore that motivation a little bit more. Also, we should point out the fact that Bernard is looking for Maeve means that his interests now align with Sirax. So perhaps we'll see some sort of a team up there. Anyway, with Stubbs' help, Bernard gets into a part of Westworld or a part of Dolus Park, which is still functioning, and he finds a tablet. Now, Bernard has been checking himself for corrupt code over and over. He's been checking himself to see if Dolores has manipulated any of his code, but he's been checking himself using a tablet he built. If Dolores messed with his code, perhaps the tablet he built, it, he was programmed to build a messed up tablet that wouldn't be able to detect that messed up code. So he's in Dolores Park. He's got clean equipment here. He can do a true scan of his brain. So. They do that, 
They get out of the park and Bernard learned a pretty important piece of information here. He learned that Dolores was looking into Liam, aka the guy from Insight, aka Dolores' fake boyfriend, the one who doesn't actually run the Reho database. So Bernard and Stubbs, they got their lead. They know who to look for. This should lead them right to Dolores, or perhaps it'll lead them to Chirac. Either way, we see the thread that will get these two storylines to collide. With that information, Bernard and Stubbs go to leave the island, and Stubbs says, I'll get you to the vessel, and then I'll retire myself. <laughs> so I get one last <laughs> that, attempt at suicide. That was the best part of the episode. Oh, uh, it was great. It was I. It's so good because the Liam Hemsworth character it's just felt strange the last two seasons. He, he seems like he's important. You can't really tell why he's important. He should just be a faceless guard, except for the fact that he's played by a relatively famous actor. And so I, I've been waiting for his character to be elevated in some way. And we finally get that here. And I think he's going to legitimately, le legitimately be an interesting character to follow because the idea of a robot that's been programmed with one mission it's now completed the mission, but now it has to go on living. Now, to some degree, that's not exactly the case anymore because Bernard has now. So Stubbs says he's going to retire himself. <laughs> Bernard reprograms him. So Stubbs has been given this core mission to protect Bernard. So I guess to the extent that he's still protecting Bernard, he still has that core function. I, I love how he's like, you could have just asked, which... It's, it's not true. It's not actually true. <laughs> he had no, it, it was in his code. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to watch the Stubbs character sort of wake up. Will he start to develop more of a personality? Will he start to develop more of a desire to do anything besides his core directive? And will he eventually be freed from that? I, I have a feeling we'll see a scene at some point where Stubbs uh, is told by Bernard, hey, you protected me. You did a great job this season. You're free to go until I need you again. Because I would love to see that storyline explored. A robot with a core function and an AI. Core function is complete, and now he has to just go live in the real world. This idea was explored somewhat in Terminator Dark Fate. Won't go into spoilers. I don't think the movie did a great job of exploring that, so I would love, I think Jonathan Nolan, he could do that here in Westworld. I'd love to see it. So... I loved the Bernard and Stubbs storyline. I think they're setting up a great partnership between the two of them. And again, this episode so many times showed me something where I rolled my eyes and said, I don't want to do this again. I don't want Bernard back in the park. So they took him out of the park again very quickly. And they threw Stubbs in there to elevate the storyline again, add comedic relief, and add just another layer of interest to it. Other random thoughts? was cool to see that dragon. Yeah, so they yeah. hinted at another park, a sort of night-themed park. I wonder if they reused some of the Game of Thrones CGI and models. I wondered if they were able to reuse some of the CGI dragon models from Game of Thrones. Either way, it was cool to see that here. Looked great. Love the scene of Stubbs with the axe. He, too, seemed like he was trying a little extra hard to, yes, disarm and maybe harm people, but wasn't trying to kill anybody. In fact, at one point, he told one of the guards, run. So they're doing a great job of making all the characters, including the hosts, somewhat sympath sympathetic. And I love that because that was one of my major complaints for season two. I'll also say that like I said at the top of this video, one of the things I missed is that in episode one of this season, we were outside the park. The world was interesting. It was awesome. And I was a little frustrated to see us back there this episode. But then we find out Maeve wasn't in the park. She was in a simulation. Bernard, now he's out of it. So I think I can say I'm pretty equally interested in every storyline that is going on in this show right now. So. I hope we don't have, I wouldn't call episode two a misstep, but I will say it stepped away from the stuff that I was super invested in. Now I feel reinvested and I hope that continues for the next six episodes because by the way, if you weren't aware, most episodes, uh, season one and two of Westworld were 10 episodes each. This season will only be eight episodes. Before we wrap up, I should say one of the mysteries that we do still have 
this season is that at the end of season two, when Dolores leaves the park, she leaves with five pearls. Now remember, each of those pearls contains the consciousness of a host. So not all of those pearls have been accounted for at this point. We've got five of them. We know that one of them is in Bernard. So there you go. We know one of them is in Charlotte, the CEO at Dolis. We don't know who that is, though. We know it's in the Charlotte body, but we don't know whose consciousness that actually is. We also have Collins, the security guard that Dolores replaced with a host in the last episode. So then we've got two. We don't know where they are. Do Dolores could still be walking around with them. They might not be in a host right now. So to recap, we've got one Pearl. We know whose body is in it, and we know whose consciousness it is. That's Bernard. We've got two Pearls. Collins and Charlotte. We know whose body it is. We don't know whose mind it is. And then two pearls that are totally unaccounted for. And that is really, at this point, one of the mystery boxes we have that, judging by how quickly they've been revealing things this season, I have a feeling that box won't stay shut the whole season. I have a feeling we'll learn more about those pearls in the next couple of episodes. Anyway, I think with that, Alon, any final thoughts on the episode? I think we're both feeling pretty positive on season three as a whole so far. Yeah, I like it so far. Season uh, episode two, not I didn't like it as much as episode one, but I still like it. And my favorite part is that Bernard is not a stumbling, bumbling fool <laughs> like he was in season two. He has a lot more personality and he's much more interesting now. Yeah, and I think we could say that every character on this show has been elevated. I am interested and curious about every single episode, about every single character that's taking on a role this season. So the show visually looks great. The characters are great. The plotting, the pacing is all really fine-tuned compared to season two. So I'm loving this show. Sadly, the ratings are down compared to last season. I think a lot of that is because of how inaccessible season two was. It was a tough show to watch last season, but hopefully with word of mouth, people will start to get back into season three, especially when they hear that it is sort of a soft reboot. It has kind of started things over in a way, and I think it's way more accessible than season two. So I'm hoping those ratings come back up because I know in a recent interview the creators of this show did say they see it going for at least one more season. So I don't think season three will end conclusively. So I am crossing my fingers that the ratings come back up. It, the show is doing well, but I want to make sure it does well enough that we get another season, especially now that this show has gotten back to the greatness we had in season one. Anyway, with that, I think we can wrap it up. So just one more reminder, if you're enjoying this video, hit that like button hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. You get notified the next time we go live so you can join the stream, be a part of the conversation, and we will see you on the next One Take.